In March 1926, four students from Cambridge University took a vacation in Corsica, an island off of France. For 10 days, they biked around and hiked the craggy hills and stuffed themselves with seafood slathered in decadent sauces and washed it down with wine. One night, they got caught in a storm. The friends ducked into an inn and huddled around the fire. And like many young people aching to assert themselves, <laughs> they had a pretentious chat about literature. One of them declared that Tolstoy was the writer he most admired. But another one, Robert Oppenheimer, future father of the atomic bomb, just shook his head. Dostoevsky is superior, Oppenheimer insisted. He gets to the soul and torment of man. Uncomfortably, the friends soon saw a bit of that torment. Over dinner a few nights later, Oppenheimer seemed agitated. Now, he was always restless, both mentally and physically, a fidgety fellow whose quick mind leapt from topic to topic. But that night he seemed especially agitated. He would not say why. Then a waiter interrupted to tell Oppenheimer when the next ferry was returning to the mainland. His friends were surprised. Why was Robert leaving early? Oppenheimer said he could not bear to tell them. But after some more wine, he announced himself ready to confess. His friends no doubt winked and nudged each other. It had to be some love affair. It was not. Oppenheimer began talking about his tutor back in Cambridge. He hated the man. So before leaving on vacation, Oppenheimer had injected poisonous chemicals into an apple. Then he left the apple on his tutor's desk to murder him. The revelation obviously horrified his friends, but it also baffled them. How could someone spend his days wandering Corsica, eating and biking and discussing literature while a murder plot was unfolding? It was their first glimpse into the dark, twisted, Dostoevskian soul of Robert Oppenheimer. From the Science History Institute, this is Sam Keen and the Disappearing Spoon, a topsy-turvy, sciency history podcast, where footnotes become the real story. Robert Oppenheimer came from money, lots of money. His father ran a business importing textiles. Robert was born in 1904 into a New York penthouse with paintings by Van Gogh and Picasso on the wall. And his father spoiled Robert and his brother Frank. Once, when Frank mentioned that he'd like to read some Geoffrey Chaucer poems, his father ran right out and bought a copy from 1721, a rare binding. Anything the boys wanted, he handed them on a platter. Perhaps not surprisingly, Robert grew up pretentious and unpopular. He once told a friend, ask me a question in Latin and I shall answer you in Greek. I mean, (laughs) what a twerp. He later called himself a repulsively good little boy. Other kids sensed this and bullied him. At summer camp once, the other campers stripped him naked, painted his privates green, and made him sleep in an ice house overnight. Feeling unloved, Oppenheimer withdrew into a world of poetry and physics. As he once told his brother, I need physics more than I need friends. He raced through school gobbling up material and graduated at age 17, a striking young man with pale blue eyes and thick black curly hair. He was also cornstalk thin. He ate mostly chocolate and artichokes. His favorite lunch was what he called a black and tan, peanut butter toast with chocolate syrup. Obviously, Oppenheimer attended college at Harvard. (laughs) Where else would one go? He started racing through classes there, too taking six every semester. Starting his junior year, he began taking graduate courses in physics and audited even more courses on top of that. Now, there is no way anyone could have absorbed all the material in six plus Harvard classes. His quick mind allowed him to skate by for a while, but he later acknowledged the harm of this rapid fire approach to learning. As a scientist, Oppenheimer got bored easily and liked to jump around to different fields. 
but he didn't simply go wherever his fancy led him. He always jumped into trendy fields. He liked being at the center of things. And when he jumped into a trendy new field, his quick mind often provided some important insights. But because he had raced through his basic physics classes at Harvard, he lacked the fundamental knowledge to make anything more than an initial and sometimes superficial contribution. This deficit would haunt him the rest of his career. After Harvard, Oppenheimer went to Cambridge University in England. There, he badly wanted to work with the legendary physicist Ernest Rutherford. But Rutherford was suspicious of Oppenheimer's superficial approach to physics, and he rejected him. This rejection shocked Oppenheimer. He was used to getting whatever he wanted. Now, the scientist Oppenheimer ended up working with instead was no slouch. He was a Nobel Prize winner. But the rejection burned Oppenheimer and it set the tone for a tumultuous stint at Cambridge. The second choice scientist put Oppenheimer to work making strips of beryllium for a research project. Perhaps he was trying to gauge Oppenheimer's dexterity for lab work, or maybe to humble him. Regardless, Oppenheimer considered this menial task beneath him. Oppenheimer also found the lectures at Cambridge boring. Worst of all, he was lonely far removed from the family that had spoiled him. Given his frustrations and his high-strung personality, he fell into a trough of depression. He also grew mentally unstable. One of his few friends in England was Francis Ferguson. Ferguson's family owned a ranch in New Mexico where Oppenheimer had stayed once while recovering from an illness. Ferguson was also studying physics in England. Ferguson was not half as gifted as Oppenheimer but he was far more diligent. As a result, Ferguson was thriving in both his classes and his social life. He even got engaged in the mid-1920s. So how did Oppenheimer react to his old friend's engagement? It enraged him. When he heard the news, he leapt on top of Ferguson, wrestling him to the ground and trying to choke him. Now, no one ended up getting hurt. Having lived on a ranch, Ferguson was buff and strong. Oppenheimer was just a soft, rich kid, and he weighed only 130 pounds. Ferguson tossed him off like a blanket and told him to grow up. Still, the scene disturbed Ferguson. Was his friend becoming unhinged? Ferguson was right to worry. Like all Cambridge students, Oppenheimer had an official tutor. This was an older graduate student who acted like a mentor. His tutor's name was Patrick Blackett. Blackett was robust, popular, and good with his hands, everything Oppenheimer was not. Oppenheimer developed a seething hatred for him. Things came to a head in 1926 when Oppenheimer put a poisoned apple on Blackett's desk, then left to vacation in Corsica. Thankfully, Blackett never ate the apple, but Oppenheimer's companions in Corsica spilled the beans. And when Cambridge University found out, the administrators decided to press charges of attempted murder. And they would have. Except Oppenheimer's rich father happened to be visiting that week. He begged Cambridge to spare his precious, genius son. So Oppenheimer got off with mere probation. Oddly, Oppenheimer's mental health improved after he tried to murder his tutor. It helped that he transferred from Cambridge to the University of Göttingen in Germany. Göttingen was the center of the new science of quantum mechanics and had frequent visitors like Niels Bohr. In Göttingen, Oppenheimer's quick mind impressed Bohr and many others, and his old intellectual swagger returned. During Oppenheimer's PhD defense, one of the examining professors admitted that he, the professor was trembling in fear the whole time. He was worried that Oppenheimer, a graduate student, was about to turn the tables and start interrogating him. Despite the good it did him, Göttingen had one negative effect on Oppenheimer. The university was the center of the physics world, and Oppenheimer grew addicted to the limelight. After that, he was always chasing the dragon of fame and renown. As his friend Freeman Dyson said, he always wanted to be at the center of things. That is a good quality for politicians and soldiers, but bad for original thinkers. Oppenheimer paid too much attention to famous people working on fashionable topics.
After Göttingen, Oppenheimer became a professor at Cal Berkeley. There was some brilliant physics going on there. Unfortunately, Oppenheimer could not focus long enough to make the big splash everyone expected. For instance, in the 1930s, he co-wrote a paper on what's called the photoelectric effect. This describes how light rays can eject electrons from metals. Albert Einstein actually won his Nobel Prize for work on the photoelectric effect. And there were more prizes to be won in this field, just not by Oppenheimer. After co-writing the paper with a graduate student, Oppenheimer got itchy and jumped to another topic that seemed sexier. Meanwhile, the graduate student kept plugging away. He was dimmer than Oppenheimer, but had more discipline. He resolved some problems that had limited the earlier paper and soon won a Nobel Prize for himself. The impatient Oppenheimer missed out. This tendency to leap from topic to topic frustrated Oppenheimer's colleagues, especially when he would jump to areas outside of physics. He would simply drop physics for months to read Proust or learn Sanskrit. Oppenheimer also threw himself into trendy left-wing politics, like throwing fundraisers for the communists in the Spanish Civil War. Plus, instead of choosing sharp graduate students to challenge and push him, Oppenheimer recruited impressionable types who fawned over him. With one student, Melba Phillips, he even tried seducing her. He drove her to a secluded spot overlooking San Francisco one night and parked his car, a wildly inappropriate situation to put a student in. But if you're fearing this scene will end with another crime, don't worry. After parking, Oppenheimer suddenly decided to take a walk. Phillips, sitting alone, ended up falling asleep in the car. She woke hours later to find Oppenheimer still missing. Frantic, she called the police who searched the city and found Oppenheimer asleep at home. He apologized, explaining that he had forgotten about Phillips and their date. He just had other things on his mind. More commonly, Oppenheimer displayed contempt for his graduate students. In seminars, he would snarl and dismiss their ideas as stupid. His students worshipped him anyway. Colleagues used to snicker about how they talked like him and even walked like him. One Russian student tried to take the same class with him four times, just to bask in his presence. Oppenheimer finally kicked her out, only to let her back in when she went on a hunger strike. These were less students than disciples. Having disciples around only magnified Oppenheimer's self-importance. He seemed to think of himself as an ubermensch, someone too good for little things like double-checking his work. As a result, he developed a reputation for sloppiness. He would race through calculations on his papers as if he was merely auditing the topic. His friend Freeman Dyson remembers Oppenheimer as constantly fidgeting, the most restless person he had ever met. Someone once said of Oppenheimer, that no man was ever photographed more often smoking a cigarette. He smoked largely because he could not sit still and just be with his own thoughts. As Dyson once said, Oppenheimer lacked Zitzfleisch. If you've been wanting to learn a new language, now is the time to start. Rosetta Stone gets you conversation ready fast. You'll be able to order sushi in Japan, ask for a cerveza in Mexico, or find the perfect pasta in a tiny Italian village. Rosetta Stone has been the expert in language learning for 30 years. They have helped millions of people build the fluency and confidence to speak new languages. Rosetta Stone breaks down your new language into bite-sized pieces. That way, you can make progress even if you only have 10 minutes at a time. And with the award-winning Rosetta Stone app, you can learn anytime, anywhere, at home, while traveling, on your commute, wherever it's convenient. For a limited time, Disappearing Spoon listeners can get Rosetta Stone's lifetime unlimited subscription for 40% off. It gives you access to all 25 of their languages forever. Visit rosettastone.com today. Rosetta Stone, how language is learned. Weddings, college graduations, your stepmom placing third in a dog grooming competition. We've all got reasons to celebrate and give gifts this summer. So give your loved ones something they will actually love. Give them drinks. And get those drinks from Drizzly, the go-to app for alcohol delivery. 
With Drizzly, you can choose from a huge selection of beer, wine, and spirits at local stores. Then get them all delivered to your door, or wherever the summer shindig is happening. You'll save money, too, by comparing prices and finding the best deals on the best drinks. Then you can spend the extra dough on something that you really need. Books, clothes, lawn ornaments, whatever. And ordering is easy peasy. Just download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com today. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com. Ding dong, it's Drizzly. Must be 21 or over, not available in all locations. In a literal sense, Zitzfleisch means sitting flesh in German, the butt. But it's also slang for the ability to sit down and work, work, work a problem until you crack it. Oppenheimer lacked this skill. His most notorious deficit of Zitzfleisch occurred in 1939. Oppenheimer and a colleague were playing around with Einstein's relativity equations. Then they noticed something funny. If a gigantic star burned through all its fuel and collapsed on itself, the star's gravitational field would be so intense that not even light could escape it. They had just discovered black holes. Now, Einstein hated the idea of black holes, even though his own equations implied that they existed. Einstein found black holes monstrous, abhorrent. But Oppenheimer was willing to go places Einstein wasn't. It was a brilliant insight. So how did Oppenheimer capitalize on his brilliant initial insight? He didn't. He published a mistake-filled paper about black holes and then just drifted to other topics. Over the next few decades, black holes became one of the hottest fields in physics. As I mentioned in a previous podcast, black holes led to Stephen Hawking's biggest breakthroughs, and they're now on the forefront of efforts to unite relativity and quantum mechanics. Beyond being frickin' cool, black holes are a big deal scientifically. But even though Oppenheimer lived 27 years after his initial paper, he never published another word about black holes. People asked him about this sometimes, why he'd quit. Oppenheimer would treat this question with disdain, as if the question was bad manners, like they had asked about his bowel movements or some other personal topic. Then he would change the subject. But in a way, this topic was personal to him. Like Leonardo da Vinci, Oppenheimer simply did not have the gumption to see his masterpiece through. And that burned him. A few years after his black hole paper, Oppenheimer joined the Manhattan Project to build the atomic bomb. And despite my ragging on Oppenheimer's science, he did an incredible job as an administrator there. As a leader, Oppenheimer's quick mind proved a huge asset. He immediately penetrated to the heart of every matter. And if he didn't have the gumption to stick things through, well, that's what underlings were for. For better or worse, atomic bombs probably never would have been built without Robert Oppenheimer. After World War II, the vast majority of scientists on the Manhattan Project were relieved. They had done their duty and could go back to doing what they loved, puttering around in the lab, tinkering with equations, real science. Not Oppenheimer. During the war, he had been important, and he craved more fame. Within two weeks of the war's end, he was already briefing the Secretary of War about atomic weapons. He was already slipping into the skin of another, even less scientific Robert Oppenheimer, the political mover. Inevitably, his science suffered. After the Manhattan Project, Oppenheimer published just five more papers his whole life, little things he would just dash off. He was too busy playing politics. And he was playing different politics than he did before. He shifted sharply away from the trendy left-wing scene at Berkeley. In fact, he later named names to authorities and got close friends fired for their past involvement in the Communist Party, all to prove that he himself was politically trustworthy. But Oppenheimer's foray into politics ended badly. In 1954, a few conservative scientists dredged up Oppenheimer's past and damned him as a communist sympathizer and a danger to national security. Naming names hadn't helped. Contentious hearings were later held, and Oppenheimer was stripped of his security clearance. It was a humiliating ordeal, and he withdrew from the political world in disgrace. 
Most biographers treat those humiliating hearings as the central tragedy in Oppenheimer's life. But the friends who knew Oppenheimer best saw things different. They knew about Oppenheimer's frustrating brilliance, an incandescent mind that simply could not focus and see things through. To them, the tragedy of Oppenheimer's life was that he never became the Einstein that he could have been. And the saddest part was, Oppenheimer knew this. Given all the cigarettes he smoked, no one was surprised when Oppenheimer developed cancer in 1965. He sank quickly, and he was bedridden by 1967. Oppenheimer's wife Kitty was reduced to begging his friend Freeman Dyson to visit him on his deathbed. She also asked Dyson to engage Robert in some scientific work. She said that he realized he had squandered his potential, and he wanted to give science one last shot. She hoped Dyson could spur him on. But Dyson declined. As he later said, I agreed with Kitty's diagnosis about the root of Oppenheimer's despair, but I had to tell her that it was too late. I told her that I would like to sit quietly with Robert and hold his hand. His days as a scientist were over. It was too late to cure his anguish with equations. <laughs>